Station Houston. Are you ready for the event? And I uh, didn't get a uh, comm on that one, uh, Karen. Could you check the event or check the uh, microphone? Nothing there. Stand by. We're ready for the event. Uh, it looks like normal comm uh, on our end with the microphone. Okay, we're going to flex push to talk on space to ground two for Karen and uh, and Chris. And uh, just checking again, are you ready for the event? We yeah, sure are, Houston. We're ready for the event. And Kansas Cos Cosmosphere, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. This is the Kansas Cosmosphere in Hutchinson, Kansas, calling the International Space Station. Do you read? Have you loud and clear from the International Space Station to Kansas? Welcome on board. Well, welcome to the Cosmosphere, and thank you for joining us. We have a group of students with questions, and we're going to start with Chase Bowman. Chris, um, what are your favorite Earth features to for photograph? Hi, Chase. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting things to look at at the Earth, but... Um, I think I'm sort of partial to where the water meets the land, and there's some neat currents that you can see, and uh, particularly where the rivers empty into the oceans, and uh, and you see the pattern of sediment and things like this that forms the river deltas. So I, I find that pretty neat to look at. Um, I'm Elizabeth, and I have a question for Karen. What are some adjustments that your body has made since arriving to the International Space Station? Our bodies do have to go through some adjustments. In the first couple days, one of the things we notice the most is how the fluid shifts in our body because gravity isn't pulling it down. Our faces get kind of puffed up, and we also notice that we have to go to the bathroom quite a bit. But once that, after a couple days, that starts to, uh, to normalize, and we, uh, we feel fine after a couple days, um, another thing, our bodies, what our bodies want to do is, since we don't really use our bones all that much here in space, our bodies, our bones want to degrade. So we have to do everything we possibly can to keep them strong. So that's why we do special exercises and running on a treadmill and all of that. Um, and also our hearts. Our hearts don't have to work as hard. And so they want to adapt to zero gravity, but we try not to let it. For Chris, how do you clean the International Space Station? Well, it just so happens to have uh, one of those devices that's helped us do that right here. This is our space vacuum cleaner. And uh, when you drop things here on the space station, they don't go to the floor. They move all around and ultimately get sucked up into the air conditioning filters, and that's what happens to all the dust. Karen's hair, for example. I don't have any, so my hair doesn't go there, but all of it ends up in the air conditioning returns. And on Saturday mornings, we go around the space station and vacuum up all those locations and uh, and then wipe down all of the common areas that we touch. Because uh, you, you tend to be sort of a little greasier, I think, up here, your body, because you're not taking showers. We're cleaning off with baby wipes and things. So we need to wipe down... Uh, the common areas, common use areas like the kitchen and the handrails that we use all the time. So we do that once a week on Saturday mornings. My name's Catherine, and I have a question for Karen. What are your favorite foods to eat in space? I actually like the uh, breakfast foods probably the most. Every morning I like to get my coffee. Uh, we drink coffee in a bag that looks very much like like this, this is a drinking water bag, but we drink our coffee, we hydrate it with water. And uh, and I also like 
some of the cereals that we hydrate, granola and oatmeal, and some packaged food like uh, a cinnamon scone is one of my favorites that comes in a pack like this. And, uh, and we get some other um, meats and vegetables that come in packs like that. But I think the breakfast foods are my favorite. My name is Gabriel, and I have a question for Chris. What, what do you miss most about life on Earth? Well, there's lots of things. Uh, at a personal level, I miss my family, um, but we get I get to talk to them uh, often, so that's nice. But it doesn't replace the being home. Um, but uh, on a daily practical level, I probably miss baked goods. I really like chocolate chip cookies and brownies and those sort of things. And, and although we have some stuff like that. It's just not quite the same as a uh, fresh out of the oven gooey chocolate chip cookie. So that's probably one of the things I miss. My name is Caleb, and I have a question for Karen. Do you have a favorite research project you've worked on? There are so many interesting projects that we're working on, it would be hard to name a favorite. But I can, I can think of one that we're working on this week that is very interesting. We're looking at uh, ultrasounds of our spine because, like I talked about before, how our bones want to degrade when we're in space. We're looking at uh, our spines and how they are affected by the, the lack of gravity. And one of the neat things about the way we're doing this is on the Earth, a lot of times this is done with MRIs and other really, really big equipment. And we have to do it out of necessity because we don't have that equipment here. We have to do it with ultrasounds. And this might actually be useful for other places on the Earth, uh, remote locations or places where they can't necessarily have an MRI machine, where they can take ultrasounds, or which, which are much more compact, and do diagnosis on people. So I'm hoping that this will not only help um, those of us who are flying in space, but also help people on Earth to be able to use ultrasounds in the way we're using them. My name is Madison, and I have a question for Chris. How is sleeping in space different from on Earth? Um, Madison, did you say how is living different or is how is bathing different? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Sleeping. Sleeping. Ah, okay. So the big there's a couple differences that I notice. I like a pillow, and uh, and your head doesn't have that sensation of a pillow, so that takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's not a big deal. And the other weird thing is your arms. You relax, when you relax and fall asleep, your arms kind of float out in front of you. And if you do nothing to them, they, they move around at night and they can wake you up and you wake up with a weird feeling that you're out of control. Uh, so you can put them inside your sleeping bag or cross your arms. Uh, different people have different techniques. In fact, we talk about it at meals. What do you do with your arms when you sleep? Um, uh, so that's those t two things are the big differences. How do you manage your your arms and legs and the absence of a pillow? My name is Emma, and my question is for Karen. What is your daily schedule like? On the weekdays, we wake up about 6 o'clock in the morning. We use Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT, and we um, start by doing, you know, doing everything, normal things that you do in the morning after you get out of bed and have breakfast. And then we have a daily planning conference with all of the space centers around the world at about 7 or 7.30. And then we start our work day where we do various science experiments. We do maintenance on various things. We do transfer of cargo. We just had a vehicle arrive a couple days ago, and we started today transferring some of the cargo onto the space station. And then we have an hour for lunch, and also during the week work day we do a couple hours of exercise. And then in the evening, around 7 or 7.30 again, we have another daily planning conference with the control centers on Earth. And then go to bed probably about 10 o'clock at night. And in the weekends we uh, clean on Saturdays and mostly have Sunday off. Uh, 
I'm Gabe, and I have a question for Chris. How often do, how often and with what methods do you get to communicate with your family and friends back on Earth? That's a fun question to answer because it's a fun time for us to talk with those people that we care about. And uh, we do have email, although um, on the ground you're used to hitting send and that email going right away. We exchange our emails, or the ground exchanges them for us about three or four times a day. Um, and then depending on where we are with the satellite coverage, we have the ability to make a telephone call. You can't call us, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we can call down at certain periods of time. So I can talk to my friends and family that way. And then once a week, uh, usually on the weekends, we'll have a scheduled family conference where it's um, kind of like FaceTime or Skype with a, with a video and, and talking. So that's a really nice uh, time to, for us as well. So several different ways we can talk with our friends and family. Hi, my name is Dylan Staten, I have a question for Karen. What ISS module do you spend the most time in, and what do you do there? Boy, we spend a lot of time in various modules throughout the day, but one of the ones that probably gets used the most is called Node 3, and it's used a lot. It has our exercise equipment, it has a treadmill, it has a, um, a resistive exercise device that's kind of like lifting weights, our bath is in there, and also if you go through node 3 you get to our cupola, which is the big window that looks down on the earth. So that module is probably the used the most throughout any given day. My name is Jackson, and this question is for Chris. How is training in the neutral biopsy laboratory different from the actual space walks? Well, you know what? It's surprisingly similar. That's one thing I noticed um, when I went outside, and once I got comfortable, it felt very much like being in the pool. But the, the part to that is once I got comfortable. The big difference is in the pool, it's just a concrete bottom below you. Uh, in space, there's no concrete bottom, and it just falls down the way to the Earth uh, 200 or so miles below, and it's moving quickly. Uh, the other big difference, we go around the world every 90 minutes. So 45 minutes about, we have sunlight, and about 45 minutes, we have darkness. So, And when it's dark, it's pitch dark. And out there on a spacewalk with your helmet lights illuminated, you can see maybe um, a 10-foot circle in front of you, and the rest is just pitch dark that you can't see. And in the pool, it's, the lights are always on, and it's always daytime, so uh, it's difficult to train for that nighttime period. So there's a couple things that really can get your attention when you first uh, become a spacewalker, but once you settle in, it's a lot like just being in the pool. My name's Adelaide, and the question for Karen: How much time do you have to relax, and what and what do you do in your downtime? Weekends are mostly the time for relaxing. We do have evenings where we finish up with our work about 7:30 in the evening, but bedtime is around 10. So after we eat dinner and get ourselves cleaned up, there really isn't all that much time for relaxing. On Saturdays, we spend about half the day, and the rest of the day we get to relax. And then Sunday is mostly a downtime. I spend a lot of the time taking pictures, reviewing my pictures, talking to my family. Um, I brought some other stuff I would like to do um, for sewing and a lot of the hobbies I like to do when I'm on the earth. But that period of time, people can watch movies, can read books. There are lots of lots and lots of things we can do to stay busy in our downtime. My name is Amari. And this is a question for Chris. What are the differences between flying on the space shuttle and Soyuz spacecraft, and how is training different? 
That's a good question. Really insightful. Um, so the space shuttle, the ride up, I felt um, it was very bumpy and, and loud for the first two minutes when the solid rocket motors were firing. And then it got, I thought, really smooth and sort of quiet um, for the rest of the ride under powered flight. The Soyuz, it's such a smaller spacecraft. I felt a lot of little motions as the uh, computers tried to fix any course corrections and things like this. So you, I, I've got a sense of uh, smaller motions, a lot more in a Soyuz than I did in a shuttle, getting up to the orbit. Um, the big difference when you get to orbit is space. The Soyuz is very small, kind of like a Volkswagen Beetle or a Mini Cooper kind of a car compared to a King Cab pickup truck. Neither one is right, uh, more right than the other, just different types of cars, different types of spaceships. And the training is different uh, mostly because in the shuttle all of it is done at, in Houston and where we live. So we're home with our, with, uh, at work, a normal working day. Um, and the Soyuz, all the Soyuz specific training is done in, in Russia, in Star City. So we spend a lot of time uh, away from Houston in, in Russia preparing for the Soyuz flight. So really good question. My name is Tess, and my question is for Karen. The stars, our moon, and the planets must be very, very beautiful from space. What has impressed you the most? There are quite a few beautiful things to look at when you look out our windows here. The thing that I found the most impressive is watching a sunrise because it kind of sneaks up on you. You look out the window, and it's completely dark. And the next thing you know, the modules on the space station that you can see start lighting up. And then you start seeing a blue line on the edge of the Earth that starts, and sometimes you'll see other colors, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the, the line on the Earth where it's between the black and the blue just starts to slowly creep along the Earth. And it's so beautiful. It's, the, the way I'm describing it doesn't do it justice. It's even more beautiful than you can possibly describe. My name is Thaddeus, and I have a question for Chris. Is it confusing for your bodies to go through so many sunrises and sunsets during the day? Well, um, you would think it would be, but actually we turn the lights on in the space station when we wake up. And the same sort of thing you do at home, you walk around in your pajamas for a little while, have your breakfast, and then get dressed for the day. We do that exact same thing. And we, and we live our day, like Karen described. Um, and sometimes we'll go to the window when we have time, and if it's daytime, we look out. If it's nighttime, we might see some cities at night, but, uh, or if we're over an ocean, there's not much to look at. And in that time, we just go away from the window. And, uh, and then at the end of our work day, when it's time for bed, we're tired because we've done our normal day, and we'll go and look at the window, and again, maybe it's daylight outside, maybe it's dark, or we watch the sunrise and sunset. But to our bodies, it to me, it feels like we just lived and worked a normal day, and it's time for bed, and, and uh, I like to sleep, so when it's, when it's 10 o'clock or so, there's no doubt in my body's mind that it's time to go to bed. Uh, so it really, it's after uh, a little bit of what, what I would say is like jet lag when you travel a, a long distance on an airplane. After you get used to that, it's, uh, it's just like a normal working day. My name is Jacob, and my question is for Karen. Do previous residents of the space station leave behind any mementos? Actually, most people, everybody, I think, cleans up pretty well after themselves. You try and keep it nice for the next guys that are coming, but they do leave some things. Um, when I first got here, actually, I didn't have a lot of clothes with me because they were all coming on the automated transfer vehicle, which just arrived a couple days ago. And uh, one of the guys had left a pair of uh, long uh, legs um, and arm pajamas that I could wear, which was very, very nice. Um, also, some of the folks leave some of their... Uh, treats, candy, uh, snacks, like that. 
Um, there's a library of books. People leave books here that we can read. Um, there's a guitar and a piano, a keyboard that folks can play. So, so things kind of get left here, things that, um, that people think others might enjoy. My name is Ivy, and this question is for Chris. Does any of your scientific research require you to experiment on each other? Oh, well, yes, it does. Um, Karen described earlier the ultrasound project that we're working on, and when one person is the subject, the other person um, is the operator of the ultrasound machine. And then some uh, experiments that we do involve taking blood samples, and we'll help each other with uh, drawing each other's blood. Um, I'm trying to think. What else? Those are the, the big ones, drawing fluid and, oh, and eyes. I forgot about eyes. Uh, there's a lot of research about our eyesight, and we have different types of instruments to check our eyes, and we'll help each other with those things as well. So uh, there's quite a few uh, medical experiments that we help each other with. Well, from, for all the people here at the Cosmosphere, we would like to give out a big thank you to Chris Cassidy and Karen Nyberg for visiting with us this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. We had a good time talking with you, and hopefully uh, some of you will decide to uh, follow dreams and pursue a career in space. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you, Kansas Cosmosphere. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.